I'm Victoria Stodden, and I'm a professor in the statistics department at Columbia University, and I've been researching issues with open science broadly for the last two or three years. My PhD was from Stanford, and what I, what I was taught by my PhD advisor in the statistics department was that we shared all our code and we shared all our data whenever we published a paper. And that was somewhat how I was raised, but that was the beginning of why I became interested in these issues and um, why I'm now um, something, a little bit of an advocate for some of these things. So um, I also wanted to say that this is probably the most fun talk to give because there's no sense that I need to be an advocate here. Everybody's here because they're interested in these issues and recognize that they're important. So what I thought I would do in this talk was actually try and distill some of the principles and ideas that I have learned talking to community members about open science issues for the last few years and um, what I've learned about how to do this kind of advocacy. And so. With that, one of my theme is um, how transparency in scientific discovery uh, has deep impacts on innovation and also knowledge dissemination. Okay, so framing my talk, I thought about why is, why is science open in the first place, right? Like it's, transparency is such a meme these days that it seems logical to apply it to something like science, but it's not something new. This has actually been something embedded in science for hundreds of years, requiring the sharing of our methodology so that other researchers can independently verify our results. That's really the core defining principle of what separates scientific investigation and a scientific fact from whatever else we might be doing. So among other things, uh, the way I've been thinking about framing this for the talk is the facilitation of open science for issues around reproducibility of published results, uh, innovation in academia and industry, and access to scientific knowledge. So I'll touch on these three through the, through the talk. So the first one's reproducibility, my, an issue very close to my heart. Um, this won't be news to anyone in here, but I just put on uh, the slide three examples of the data deluge that's um, hitting just about every aspect of research that we do. And it's not restricted to the hard sciences. It's not restricted to the sciences. This is something that happens in fields are being transformed in social science. For example, there was a paper published in Science Magazine in 2009 where they're talking about the quantitative revolution coming from social network data and the abundance of social network data that's transformed sociology and political science, for example. A couple of other quick examples in Large Hadron Collider they are pulling off, in just one of the experiments, the CMS experiment, they're pulling off 780 terabytes a year, processing this and ending up with, I think they told me, several petabytes a year of data. So that's just one experiment in, in um, one part of the LHC. And they're also moving towards, well, how do we do this in an open way, or how do we actually preserve this to replicate our results, even within LHC itself? So these are you know, enormous and very testing questions for us as advocates of open science. Um, another quick example is Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So last year in 2010, about 50 terabytes of data if you want to download uh, images of the sky. And uh, that's you know, openly available and massive, right? Okay, so that's one way that science is changing through technology. Another way is um, through increased computational power. So we're now able to do things like the complete evolution of a physical system as a simulation, right? We can vary the parameters and rerun this physical system. This is a whole new type of investigation that's coming from the impact of technology. The last point that I think is uh, salient to our discussion is how now, for the first time, very deep intellectual contributions to science are embedded in code. And this is something that um, is, I think, sometimes overlooked in the discussions about open science. There's a lot of emphasis on the data deluge and these sort of amazing statistics about the amount of data that's available. But when you think about what's really, what science is really about, it's about thinking and communication of what we've thought about. Now, this ended up in the, often ends up in the code now and doesn't get fully captured in the published paper. I think that's a key part of what we're talking about as, as advocates of open science. Okay, and on that note about software, so as a statistician, one of our flagship journals is the Journal of the American Statistical Association, JASA, and what I did is I looked at how much of, what proportion of the publications in JASA are 
computationally focused, and of those that have a computational aspect, how many of them discuss where I could actually get the code and look at what their parameter settings were? Do they have magic numbers in their code? What were the invocation sequences of the functions, and, and do the functions actually do what the algorithm in the paper says they do? So 1996 is when I first looked at the June issue, and a little under half of, these compu of the articles were computational. So of course the other parts are, the other half is doing mathematics and they're, they're, they're showing proofs. None of those talked about where to get the code. Um, go forward 10 years, 2006, now nearly all of them are computational articles, 33 of 35, and we've got some talking about where they can get the code, about 9%. And then I also look 2009, 2011, since June just passed. Now all the articles, if you're publishing in JASA, you're publishing computational articles. You've used a computer somehow in your work. So that's really where I've been focusing my research. Are you using a computer somewhere in publishing your scientific results? And if so, how is that um, changing the way we need to think about scientific computation? So a few more people are getting it. So we're up to 21% talking about where I can download their code package or um, access the software that they use to generate these results. So that's significantly more than zero, but it's still pretty poor when, if there's any people who have ever done programming in the room, and I'm sure there are, you know how hard it is to actually replicate someone's code based on, say, for example, a four-page description of their results. It's our traditional methods of scientific publication just aren't up to the task. All of this, I think this engenders a credibility crisis and a very serious one for computational science. Um, one that means that most of our computational results that are being published now are not verifiable, they're not verified. And this is new. So you think about this in the context of the scientific method. Traditionally, we've thought of two branches of the scientific method. The first branch being the deductive branch, mathematics and logic appear in here, uh, uh, something that can be complete in a deductive system on its own. And then we started to do empirical work, and this developed the second branch of the scientific method. And this has the statistical analysis of controlled experiments, for example, hypothesis testing and so on. Um, and this has e evolved as a second branch. In keynotes, in grant applications, um, over the last several years you hear lots of discussion of the third branch of scientific method, maybe this is computational from the simulations, or even the fourth branch gets discussed about the data deluge and so on. Um, what I'd like to submit to you is that we're not yet at the stage where we can actually call this new type of method and new um, technologically driven investigations science. And this is what I think we're about in the open science movement. So the central, I'll expand on that. The central um, motivation for the scientific error is, uh, the scientific method is really to root out error. The deductive branch, these are branches, the first two branches are hundreds of years old. They've had a lot of time to think about this. Computational science, maybe we've had two decades to think about it. So for the last hundreds of years, the deductive branch has been able to develop this idea of the proof. So if you have a new mathematical fact that you want to add to this deductive system and you want to publish it, of course you're going to have to show a proof and everyone publishing in this area can understand and know exactly what the standards of this proof actually are in order to get your knowledge accepted. There are similar standards for the second branch, for the empirical branch of the scientific method. We have the machinery of hypothesis testing, structured communication of the results. You have method sections in your paper. It's very detailed on how you would actually communicate this work. The underlying reason is so that you can transfer the knowledge and other people can replicate and verify the work. Computational science as practiced today does not have these standards and does not generate reliable knowledge. Okay, so here's what I think is a framing principle to think about how to take the next step in the open discussion of open science. There is, and, and I think it revolves around this, this core concept of reproducibility. So there are different ways to think about what that means. A definition that comes up in just about every discussion of reproducibility is this um, paraphrasing by the, David Donahoe is my thesis advisor. And I'll, I'll just read you the quote because I think it's, it, I think it's actually a, a lovely phrasing of, of the way that I've been thinking about this. So the idea of reproducibility is an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, it's merely advertising of the scholarship. 
The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions that generated the figures. So the type of work we did, we would often be generating um, figures, but you could see how this would apply to um, whatever scientific computational results are being published. A simpler distilled version of this, a result is reproducible if a member of the field can independently verify the result, the idea being they don't have to contact the original author to verify the published work because that's been put out in the public, in, in the public knowledge. So there's a side effect to thinking about reproducibility as a core framing issue, is that it scopes what type of data gets shared, what you should share, what you shouldn't share, what type of metadata gets a attached to this data, and what is required in terms of sharing code. So the issue is now more clearly defined than something like we need to be open, which is very open-ended and very scary for a lot of scientists who aren't in this room. Reproducibility is something every scientist understands. So there's an enormous number of challenges to this implementation. If every scientist understands this, why hasn't it happened overnight? Right, so many of these I think um, probably you're familiar with. Um, there's requirements and pressure put on computational scientists by funding agencies and grant requirements. Um, there's patents and the ability to patent and financial incentives that computational scientists are under. Um, intellectual property constraints that um, interfere with the free and open sharing of code and the free and open sharing of data. Institutional expectations, if you're coming up for tenure when you're a young scientist, Maybe you're actually shooting yourself in the foot by paying attention to these issues of reproducibility when what's being counted are your papers and your publications. This is changing, but right now it still is a barrier that scientists will think about. Journals have particular requirements and other types of mechanisms of publications have requirements that may or may not include code and data. Generally, they don't. And if you're not subject to this requirement, why spend extra time on it? And then there's just uh, general requirements of scientific integrity. Okay, so this is a lot of words. They're on there for a reason that, that, you, that you'll understand. Um, so there are actually requirements in the grant guidelines for both National Science Foundation and the National Institutes for Health that encourage uh, and even require, in some cases, the sharing of data and, and code. And so the NSF grant, uh, grant guidelines, which have been around for years, I think 2005 and earlier, um, expects investigators to share with other researchers data, samples, physical collections, supporting materials gathered or created in the course of the work, encourages grantees to share software and inventions and make the innovations they embody widely useful and usable. Well, you know, they're singing our song, right? But what's wrong, right? This is 2005 and earlier. There's, um, NIH has been even more progressive in some sense about open data for their big projects over $500,000. Um, NIH endorses the sharing of final research data, NIH expects and supports timely release and sharing of final research data and for use by other researchers. So they aren't talking as much about code, but they are talking about um, data sharing in a very deep way. None of this is enforced, right? And I don't think this is because people are derelict or they don't believe in the principles. If you start thinking about the granularity of the research problems that these people work on, it's not at all clear. Um, the next step for every single person being the same, right? There's not a one-size-fits-all solution, and it's very difficult for a funding agency to just say, right, we're going to do this, when it impacts different communities in very different ways. In January of this year, the NSF introduced a data management plan that's required, so you have to submit two pages now with every grant application to the NSF talking about um, describing how the proposal will conform to NSF policy on the dissemination and sharing of research results. So there aren't requirements in this two-page document, but it is peer-reviewed as part of the um, grant application process. You can put basically whatever you want in there. It's open-ended, but um, it is an enormous step in what I think is the right direction for funding agency policy. So I just throw this up there because this is a little more on the NSF um, data management plan guidance, and they say things like investigators are expected to share samples, data, physical collections, expected to encourage and facilitate such sharing, and this sounds a lot like the grant guidelines. And so my point in putting this up here is this is a step towards trying to understand how to enforce their pre-existing grant guidelines, in my estimation. I mean, I'm not the NSF. Okay, other things that are very promising at the policy level for open science in 2011, in January, I think, um, the, the Act America Competes was reauthorized. And there's two very interesting sections in here, Section 103 and Section 104, that I'll just briefly highlight for you. 
Interagency Public Access Committee, coordinate federal fun science agencies and policies related to dissemination, long-term stewardship of the results of um, unclassified research, including digital data. So this is um, important, I think, in terms of the thinking about openness in science. Open access, I think, is a very, uh, probably pe people are familiar here, with the, is, is a very important sister issue to this. But now you see at the congressional level the thinking going beyond just access to the papers, but what is actually being shared in terms of scientific integrity and scientific communication, and they're talking about data. So this is something of a watershed, I think. And Section 104 is also fascinating to me because they say the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, shall develop policies for the management and use of federal scientific collections to improve quality organization access, including online access. So they're aware now that we're becoming fully digitized in what we do in science, and this is fundamentally changing our nature of our communication. Okay, innovation and technology transfer. Uh, a corollary issue, but also a fascinating issue. So this became something that's important to us as computational scientists with the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980. Now, I don't know if people can remember back to 1980. It's certainly hazy for me. But people were not uh, aware of the coming, um, at least congressional people were not aware of the coming revolution in, in computers and technology. So this was passed right on the eve of when computers would essentially pervade our um, I don't want to say our society, but pervade our practice of science. So they had no idea what was coming. And the idea of the Bayh-Dole Act was to firstly streamline the requirements of the different funding agencies for the scientific groups that they were funding. Um, secondly, and most importantly, and the biggest impact it's had, is to um, give incentives to take ideas and inventions that have been developed in academia and make them more widely available for commercial development. And the way they did this was to transfer ownership of these ideas to the institution where the scientist works. So, for example, I work at Columbia. When I was hired, as we all had to, we signed this document transferring rights to our inventions over to Columbia University. Columbia then can patent this and then has an incentive to patent it and make it available and gather money from the licensing of the patent. So this was how they thought they would transfer all this technology that was just locked up in the ivory tower out into the wider public to make it uh, available and commercializable. So what's happened now, this is what engendered all the tech transfer offices and so on at our um, universities. and. Um, now we're in a very strange place because of the ability to patent software. And now that software is so pervasive throughout science, and as we saw at the beginning, I believe that we have such deep intellectual contributions in software now. Um, now this is something that be falls under um, institutional purview, is subject to patent, and is now licensed out. Now, what does that have to do with open science, right? Um, when what we would have done if we were thinking about reproducibility is put our code and our data out there such that others can reproduce our results. Now there's a bifurcation of incentives for computational scientists because maybe they want to publish a patent this and maybe, maybe they want to start a company around it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it's a change in the scientific norms that we should be aware of. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so there are a number of barriers facing individual scientists. I touched on some of them. In 2010, I surveyed members of the machine learning community, people who had submitted to NIPS, one of the um, premier machine learning conferences, and I asked them about that particular paper they had in NIPS, whether they had um, shared the data and code openly that were, were associated with the paper and why, and if they hadn't, then why. And so. That paper itself is an entire talk, but here's one table from the paper talking about um, what, was, what, was, what were the barriers that you faced as a computational scientist when you didn't share the code or you didn't share the data. So far and away, and, and one person who wrote in in the comment spaces said that the, reason, the first reason here was like so important on a log scale. It takes a lot of work to clean up and get your data ready for sharing and get your code ready for sharing. And, and putting in that kind of time is something that's not rewarded right now in the scientific community. I believe that's changing, but, um, but it really isn't rewarded now. Um, the other problem that scientists had is they didn't, they didn't feel like they were IT people, right? So they put code out there, data out there, and they don't want to feel the raft of questions of someone who's having problems installing their package or, or whatever it is, so maybe it's just not worth dealing with the whole issue. 
um, scientists were worried about not getting attribution for their work. So this is um, something that I've been working on um, with licensing structures to encourage openness with attribution for computational scientists who are sharing their code and their data and how to work within this IP structure. Um, but there's quite a bit of concern about attribution. The next two surprised me. So when I was um, working as a computational scientist, we were aware of legal issues but not overly concerned with them. But way up on the list here is I might want to patent this software. So this is a reason why I don't want to necessarily throw it out there and possibly establish prior art and um, scupper my own patent, right? I might keep this closed. Um, and then copyright is another one people were worried about. And like I said, I've done a lot of work trying to work with the copyright issues that, that scientists are facing. I need to check things with the administration. It's a pain. I could lose future publications and get scooped. I might, why should I advantage my competitors? This is certainly a collective action problem. Why should I release, take the time and effort to release code and data when you know, the guy down the hall isn't going to do it and will look like a better scientist with more publications, right? So in a sense, if everyone moves together, we've solved that problem. So we, we have a, certainly a deep collective action problem here. And then I don't know where to put the stuff. I don't have enough space. So that was, that was the last one. Um, the last one that I certainly feel as a young professor. So here we've got um, one sort of senior looking guy and then the junior guy sitting in a chair and the senior looking guy saying behind one door is tenure, behind the other door is flipping burgers at McDonald's. So we get so specialized, right, um, that we are subject to these institutional expectations in a very deep way and, and, and caged by them. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to touch on is deeper access to scientific knowledge that comes with not just sharing the paper, which the idea was to share the methodology in the way of generating those results originally, but now if we share code and data, that's exactly what we're doing. We're putting the tools in the hands of others that can now play with the results, regenerate them, change them, try out some of their ideas, rather than reading a paper where really it's, um, it's quite um, opaque. Okay, so in a project that I'm working on now, I wanted to look at what was the state of journal requirements in terms of uh, code and data and also in terms of open access. So um, with a student this summer, I looked at 170 journals and we chose the ones that had a computational element. So all of this is just for journals that are computational in some sense, not for journals broadly. Um, and I had, we had about 14% requiring data. And there, in the computational journals, there are many that are biologically focused, and so we have accession numbers, for example. And that's why that gets to be a big number for Protein Data Bank. And then the proportion requiring code is smaller. It's about 7%. And this is a pattern that we've seen in terms of how journals adopt new policies. If journals are going to think about reproducibility and data and code sharing, they tend to think about the data first. Once the data is established as a policy, then they tend to start thinking about code. So it's not surprising to me that that number is a little smaller. Proportion requiring supplemental materials. Again, none of this is reviewed, right? So supplemental materials that you just need to put with, with your publication, about 9%. And then we looked at um, open access. Like I said, a, a sister issue, um, distinct from this issue, but, but related. And in the computational world, we had about 22% who were now open access or had options to do, to do open access, and you could pay to publish if you wanted. So that, that's ongoing work, and with the, the journals, they face their own set of constraints. Like, you might ask again, well, if reproducibility is such a core idea for computational scientists, isn't it very natural for journals to just pick up open code and open data? They have very similar problems. How do you establish standards for what is um, acceptably shared code or acceptably shared data? Um, what are the metadata? How do you, who does the archiving? Does the journal do it? Or do they, so these problems are being worked out. How do you track reuse? What's appropriate documentation? Should we be establishing sharing platforms for this? And, and who should be doing this? Is this something that happens at the federal funding agency or something that happens at the journal level or institutional level? Um, who checks any of this? Should it be reviewed? Uh, I think this is, I think this, I fall on the side of let the community check it. Uh, this doesn't necessarily need to be reviewed beforehand, but we've seen a number of very high-profile cases recently, for example, the Duke Clinical Trials case, where there seem to be assumptions and presumptions that these things are checked when they're not, and, and people need to be aware of that. Uh, less technical authors, sharing code and data is a bigger burden for them, so we need to be sensitive to different communities who have different sets of skills. Early research, evolving research, so what do you require for um, 
uh, replication in that sense? And is this something that will affect the decision of when to publish results? If they have to put code and data out, maybe they publish later and the knowledge is shared later. It's just, it, it's things to think about. It's not a clear cut question. And of course, journals want to attract the best papers and they don't want to put barriers on people who want to um, submit to their journal. Uh, I would argue, and I believe there's evidence for this, that the best papers are the ones that share the code and the data. But we'll, I think we'll get to that. Okay, so just to conclude, I wanted to mention, so this is a blizzard of words that you're not supposed to read, but the idea is to dazzle you with all the uh, movement that's happening around this issue of reproducibility across the computational sciences. So at a glance here, you can see we have um, workshops and conferences happening in applied mathematics, um, in geoscience, there's biostatistics and um, biochemical uh, uh, folks that are uh, attacking and discussing this issue, and they're using the word reproducibility. They're not saying we need to just share data and it would be nice to build on our data and reuse it. They're saying we need to worry about scientific integrity and the reproducibility of the results that we're publishing. Um, computer science, another one with the Sigma data conferences. And it goes on and on at the high levels, NSF and the Office of Cyber Infrastructure producing reports on this. So this is a deeply salient issue, and I think the people in this room are really poised to make an impact on these discussions that are happening. Remember in open science that of course scientists all have a day job, right? This isn't their job. And there's an enormous role for people with a voice to really make a difference here. So in thinking about this, I, I wanted to conclude with a couple of, well, three principles for advocacy as um, I see it, and I think most of us in this room, just even by being here, probably qualify as advocates in, in the open science movement. I would encourage working within scientific norms as much as possible. So reproducibility is a long-standing scientific norm. Scientists understand this. They understand the idea that results need to be verifiable, no matter, even if they haven't heard of open science, they, they know this. Arguments that step outside these norms are tougher. Arguments that open data for the sake of the community are tougher arguments because it's a subtle shift in our scientific norms. I think this is, reproducibility is the easier argument. Um, so talking about reproducible, re reproducible research leads to or implies open code and open data in, in my view. Um, scientific integrity, so this leads to openness because of verifiability of the results and as I've mentioned earlier because of the needs of openness and verification in establishing scientific facts that somehow we've forgotten about this and we need to remember this. Um, another thing that I think is very useful, so the data deluge as we've seen and as I'm sure you all know from your experience is affecting many fields across the computational or even the scientific research landscape. Um, Many researchers are generating questions. Researchers are generating questions. How do I share my data? What are the requirements? Where do I put this? What type of structure should I be building? Or how should I be thinking about this? Let's engage them and answer those questions. So we don't want to talk in a vacuum. We want to reach out to the community and there are questions all over the place. Just people, like I said, who have day jobs and aren't thinking about this. And let's answer their questions and engage them at the community level. And let's myth bust. So there's a, this, is, this is gradually going away over time, but, but like I saw in the survey results that I showed you, that computational scientists have lots of ideas in their mind about how it may damage them to do this. And I think really the arguments fall the other way, that the scientists who are open with code and data are the ones producing the best results and are our top scientists. And I think if we can show empirically why some of these ideas that people have in their head about open science not being, like being not valuable and being a waste of their time, I think could really put us in um, a very strong position. Okay, so I wanted to throw a couple of references up there. They're all on my web. The talk slides are actually on my website if you wanted to see them. This is Stodden.net. And, um, and the papers that I talked about with, all, with deeper discussions of the results that I mentioned in the, in the talk are available too. So thank you. Be strict here. All right, good. That's working. Okay, who is okay in the back there? I'm gonna take it back here first. Any others queuing up after that? Hold on. I'm coming to you, Brett. Hold on. Wait into the mic. 
walking it to you. I wanted to ask whether you are familiar at all with the publishing model used for the data sets for uh, recently or, or genomic um, projects that are underway where they publish the data as they're generating it but then have, you know, license or, or agreements layered on top of that to prevent certain uses of it until the, you know, whole project can be completed and the primary authors can get their publication out of it. Um, and whether you saw that as a, a viable way forward for, um, for other sorts of data-driven scientific research. So I see, so that, that's an excellent question, and I see that as a special case. So I think that, um, so there they have leapt outside the norms in the sense of sharing data pre-publication, and what it means to share data pre-publication is a specialized term even for the genomic community. It's not necessarily what you would imagine as a computational scientist with data. And um, it also leads to, to other things like sharing results before publication or open lab books and, and all these extensions of this thinking. And remember that community, so that community is probably the leader in terms of um, open science, but definitely in terms of open data. And of course, they were pushed in the rush to um, sequence the human genome, and there was, a, I'm sure everyone's familiar, and there was that sort of big intellectual war about whether this is something in the public domain or whether this is something commercializable. And, um, and so, you know, they've been doing declarations and so on about the importance of open data, and in some sense are far out ahead, at least in terms of data. But I see that as um, a, a tranche of scientific research, and there are other communities with a whole different set of norms and pressures. And these people were pushed out in front early. And so that makes sense, I think, in their research context, but I think outside of that context for other computational scientists, that is a step outside the norms. And I think if you were to approach them and say, as soon as you get your data, you need to <laughs> kind of put it online, regardless of whether you publish, they just think, you know, they just would stop talking to us. So I think, so that, that's what I mean by, we're best off working within our norms as much as possible, or within the community's norms as much as possible. Okay, just a note, we're gonna end up setting up over here for people to come up and ask questions. It'll be easier in a minute, but go ahead. So I'm wondering which is your solution for the attribution problem, because I think that's a very key point because scientists don't want to share because the, the way to build credit is through publication. Yep. But if you get credit, scientific credit, to being attributed that you, through the code that you shared, then of course. That's right, be a that's right. No, so that, that's a core question, right? So I, um, as part of my PhD dissertation, I put together um, a, a sharing platform for papers in um, sparse representation. It was called Sparse Lab. It's still, it, I did it in 2005, and it's still out there, sparselab.stanford.edu. But um, I just did a Google Scholar search sparse lab like last year or whatnot, and people are citing this. And I never really thought about it when I was a um, PhD student. I'm like, what are they citing? And I wrote some documentation technical descriptions of the software um, and made PDFs out of them, and they're citing those as papers. So th there's a deep problem because they're, they're just searching for a paper so they can shoehorn the code into their, their typical citation system that they're used to. So this is not a problem that people aren't aware of, and they're trying to come up with citation standard. Well, how do you cite data, and what does it mean when there's multi-author data sets and so on? But I think we're absolutely going in that direction. There's, um, I think there's natural hesitation around it um, because there isn't a sense yet, I think, to our shame as computational scientists, but there isn't a sense broadly that the work done um, collating data and creating data sets that are usable is as valuable as the idea generation and the results generation. And I think that's something that's changing. And, and, and it's similar with the code, and this is something that's also changing as I've talked about the intellectual contributions within code. So I think that's something that we're moving towards in terms of citation standards. I mean, we have to. There, there's just no other way. There's no other way around it. But I think the community is still kind of um, evaluating the, the value of this. I think that's okay. good. Great. Thank you so much for that tour de force, Victoria.